attention to the screen for the announcements. Welcome to the Citadel. Glad to have you here with us. And we would also like to thank those of you who have joined us online. We would like to welcome our first time guests. We're so happy you're here. Please fill out a connect card. Raise your hand if you need one, and one of our greeters will be happy to hand you one. Or scan our QR code on the screen to fill it out from your smartphone. Don't forget to download this church center app and choose the Citadel as your home church to keep up to date with upcoming events, giving, and being a part of small groups. Join us for our pre-service prayer an hour before every service in our sanctuary. We encourage everyone to join our early morning prayer from 5.30 to 6 a.m. We have a time of soaking. And from 6 to 6.30 a.m., we pray on behalf of our city, church, and family. To participate, join the Early Morning Prayer Small Group on the Church Center app to get the Zoom link. Let's agree together in prayer. Are you interested in serving by volunteering? We need your help with media, ushering, reading, and kids ministry. Sign up sheet is in the back or see Veronica Acosta. Sundays, 5 to 6.30 p.m., we have our women's, men's, and kids ministries. Women's ministry, Hearts on Fire with Ana Chavez. Men's Ministry, King of Men with Robert Acosta Sr. Kids Ministry, Cadet Edition with Catalina Campos. Come grow with us. Are you a woman between the ages of 16 to 35? If so, we have the perfect group for you. Girl Time. It's a time to hang out, fellowship, and study the women of the Bible once a month. See Emily DiCochelle for more details. Can you play an instrument? Would you like to try out for our worship team? If so, see Nancy Acosta for more information. Amen. So we're going to go ahead and take our tithes and offering. Um, we do have several ways to give. If you are giving by um, check or cash and you need an envelope, you can raise your hand and our ushers will be right here to give it to you. You can give online at www.thecitadel.church. You can text your dollar amount to 84321 or you can give in our church center app if you don't have the app you can just download it from your um the app store and then go ahead and when you enter some information you can go ahead and click give all right so as i was preparing the little tyson offering message today i got the scripture and i was kind of hesitant because i feel like every single week we've been using the same scripture and I was like, okay, enough with that scripture, right? But the Lord told me this is the scripture. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So I'm sorry if you guys are getting sick of this scripture, but you, we need to hear it. We need to grasp it. We need to get our minds wrapped around it. We need to believe it. Amen? Amen. So if you know it, you can say it with me, but it is... Um, The scripture that says, test me in this and see that I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out so many blessings you cannot contain. He says, test me. So I looked up what the word test means, as if we don't know, but I wanted the exact meaning. And this is what test means. It means to take measures to check the quality, the performance, or the right reliability of something especially before putting it into widespread use or practice okay so 10 percent is not much it's not much why do you think god is not asking for all of your money he's just trying to allow you to give him the opportunity to show you how real his word is because if you give the little bit of 10 percent he is going to give you so much blessings you don't have enough room to contain all you have to do is trust him. Trust the word just enough to give your 10% tonight. That seems crazy, right? Why do you think God will tell you, will tell you to do that? This is my opinion. I believe over and over again, all throughout scripture, you read him saying, Oh, you of little faith. 
Oh, you have great faith. Just because of your faith, your family is made whole. Just because of your faith. Everything is about faith. Um, Jesus came, he's talking about faith this, faith that. It's all about faith. Yeah. If we can grasp that, and if we can stop doubting, stop doubting with your 10%. Do it already. That's it. It's time to get your feet wet. And as when you get your feet wet and you start seeing that it's safe, we start seeing it's reliable, we start seeing it's true, then it's time to dive in. That's what God is waiting for. God is waiting for a people that will arise and say, I know your word is true. I just don't speak it. I just don't hear it. Guess what? I'm living your word. Your word says you're going to do it. You are going to do it. I don't have any doubt. So tonight, you guys, that's it. Let's lay, let our faith arise. It's time. And if you're struggling and if you have doubt, that's why he said, test me. Test me. He's not mad at you. He's not saying, oh, you don't believe me. I'm not going to do it. No, he's saying, just test me. Yeah. So I invite you to take this opportunity tonight and test him and see that he will not open the windows of heaven and pour so many blessings he cannot contain. Amen? Amen. So Lord Jesus, we come into faith right now. I pray for every person that's taking, taking that step into faith and giving you that 10%, putting their actions behind their faith. Putting your actions behind your word, Lord Jesus. I pray, Father, that you would show up more than what they could have ever imagined. More than what men could have ever done for them, Lord. I pray that you would just break chains. That you would bless them in ways they never even thought, Father. Because your word is alive, well, and true, Father. And I just thank you for this opportunity that we get to have. The promises that we get to live in because of your word. We thank you for how great you are to us, Lord. I just thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen.
And now I have the absolute privilege. You guys are in for such a treat tonight. I'm going to invite my sister Linda. When I think about the Lord, yes. how he saved me, yes. how he raised me, yes. how he filled me yes. with the Holy Ghost. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And then he filled me to the uttermost. Mm. You know, everywhere I go, I am commanded to shout and tell this world, mm. there is a risen Savior. I don't care what pit you came out of. What dilemma you're dealing with tonight, Jesus is alive. And he's well able to turn your life around. You gotta give him a chance. I tell that to you, you gotta give him a chance. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm gonna tell you straight out, church. I've come too far to be in the mully grubs, to be a lukewarm Christian, that I am not. Because I know the price my Savior paid for my soul. I know the price he paid for me. We can turn to Isaiah 46, please. I'm just going to read a scripture. God bless you tonight, everyone, for coming out. My name is Linda Harris. I am not from here. I am from Massachusetts. I come a long way by the grace of God. I don't even know how I ended up here. It's a long story. I plan to tell my story tonight, but I think I'm on assignment for some of you. Because I have a calling and God wants to use me. And I just bless the Lord for Prophet John. Can you give him a hand? And Prophet Estonian. We just want to honor them tonight and decree and declare that they are blessed, yes. highly favored of the Lord, yes. with long life. Yes. God will satisfy you and show you his yes. salvation. Yes. God is a good God. Amen? Yes. All right, Isaiah 46. And it says, verse 9, please. Remember the former things of old. You have to forgive me, I get filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. For I am God. And there is none else. I am God. And there is none like me. Check that out. There's none like me. He's an awesome right. God. Declaring, and look what we're honored to do. We follow in Jesus' footsteps. Declaring. Yes. That's what we're called to do, right? Yes. Declaring the end from the beginning <laughs> and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel yes. will stand and I will do all my pleasure. Yes. Do you want God to do all his pleasure in your life tonight, church? Yes. His counsel will stand. He's not going to force you to serve him. Right. He's not going to force you to come to church. He's not going to force you to read your Bible. He's not that way. Right. You can have it that way if you want it. But he's saying, I am God. And if you let me, my counsel, my plan for you will stand. And it will come to pass, right. no matter what gives. Amen, church? Amen. So I was going to talk about my testimony tonight. Those of you that don't know me, I've been here almost two years. Not everybody knows my story. I come a long way by the grace of God. I was raised in a Puerto Rican family. My parents came from Puerto Rico. I was not born in Puerto Rico. When I tell my story, people say, you're from Puerto Rico? I go, no, I'm not. It was my parents. I was born in New Bedford, Massachusetts, the number one whaling city port of the world, once upon a time. And once upon a time, the number one fishing industry of the world. I'm not sure if we're still the number one cranberry, we could be. So there's a lot of history in New Bedford, Massachusetts. I was raised very poor. There were seven of us. And I had four sisters, two brothers. My dad was a foreman at D. Filet. Very hard working man. My dad had muscles. He used to be a lightweight boxer in Puerto Rico. And I would bring my friends to the house just to show them his muscles. It, they were incredible. <laughs> you don't want on um, this on the knuckle pot. That would hurt you. Because I had that a few times. But anyways, um, he'd be home, you know, with the newspaper up, reading the newspaper, you know, back in the day thing. And I would come with my friends and I go, Pa. And he'd put the newspaper down and then he'd go like this and my friends would go, oh, 
I mean, he had incredible uh, muscles. My dad, he was a hard worker, <clears throat> and he gave his life to Jesus. So not thinking about that. I'll see him when I get there. So anyways, my mom was a homemaker. How did I come to Christ? I was raised in a very religious uh, family. My family went to this Puerto Rican Catholic church. I didn't understand none of that stuff, what they were doing. One time they passed this doll around and it was supposed to be Jesus and he was supposed to kiss the feet. I knew it, I was like, I'm not into this stuff. But we were forced to go because my dad was the man of the house and what he said, that was it. And believe me, he, he was the man of the house or you would, you would pay for it later on. But anyways, we were, I was born in a time of racism. It was a terrible time. Terrible time. We lived like two blocks from the Black Panther. You know, I don't know if you know about the Black Panther. They hated the police and all this, you know, the white man, all this nonsense. But I'm here to say, uh, many times the devil tried to take me out. We were out on the porch, me, my dad, and my mom. It was a beautiful sunny day, and some maniac driver uh, shot right at us. I mean, I could have been dead on my mom or my dad, but my dad said, get in the house, because he could see the car coming. That's how bad it was. Um, it was a very scary time. We didn't have uh, much TV, but we used to listen to the radio, because my brother, one of my brothers was out there hanging out, so my mom was very concerned for my second oldest brother. He was hanging out with his buddies. But anyways, that was the time and era I grew up in. Uh, as a Puerto Rican, you were persecuted. That time we had Nikki Cruz, he got saved. He was the number one, the worst gang leader of New York City. I don't know if you know about Nikki Cruz. But during that time, Puerto Ricans were labeled sticks, all this stuff. So I grew up as a young girl with terrible uh, inferiority complex, terrible fear. I was the middle sister. Nobody knew what I was going through. See, the enemy tried to destroy me as a little girl. Anyways, um, so that was the time. Uh, and I used to have panic attacks. Uh, my heart stopped racing. It was a spirit of fear trying to destroy me as well. But anyways, nobody knew about that, so I kept things to myself. But anyways, um, what ended up happening was a big revival broke out in New Bedford, and we had a Cape Verdean pastor. He spoke Portuguese, Cape Verdean. See, I was raised like in a ghetto. I knew there was whites, blacks, Puerto Ricans, Italians, Portuguese, you name it. We all hung together. We all hung together. <laughs> Forgive me. Anyways, uh, oh, Holy Spirit, hang on. Uh, so where was I? Uh, so anyways, I grew up in that kind of atmosphere. So what ended up happening was um, I didn't know how to deal with conflict as a little girl. I couldn't take it. If you were to make fun of me, look at me funny. I mean, it was, it was hard for me. As a young girl, I might have been six years old, five years old, the only thing I knew what to do was laugh at jokes or dance. I used to love dancing as a little girl. I mean, there was pictures of me dancing, Puerto Rican music, whatever, but that was me back in the day. So Rev and Shavia started through this uh, revival that was happening. Rev and Shavia went door to door carrying his Bible, and my mother honored men of the cloth. He would, she would let anyone in any minister in. So he came to our house, he broke down the bread, you know, sat down at the table, uh, spoke to us about salvation, we started getting saved. So before you know it, we were forced to go to church. Now my parents didn't go, they forced us because the band came and picked us up. Here I go up to church, you know, and I'm like, what's, you know, it's all new to me. I came out of the Catholic, I don't know what this is about. So I walk in and oh my God, the presence of God was in the Nazarene church back in the day. Back in the day, I was so afraid to give my heart to Jesus. That's how I struggled. I would just, like an icebox, I'd stand there. And one time, uh, they played Just As I Am, and that, whoo, that melted me right down. I might have been around, around eight or nine at the time. And all of a sudden, I opened my eyes. I was at the altar. I don't even know how I got there to this day. Maybe an angel picked me up and put me there because I wasn't moving. I was afraid of people, afraid of this, afraid of that. So to this day, I don't know how I made it to the altar, but I ended up giving my life to Jesus. Boy, did I weep like a baby for about three days. But anyways, um, that was the story. And as I got older, I had a hunger and a thirst for the Word of God. The Lord amped up my hunger for the Bible. I used to read the Bible for hours. I used to, uh, my mom had uh, Oral Roberts materials. My mom had a lot of faith. Uh, but anyways, um, 
I would sneak the books and read them because God gave me that hunger as a young girl. So anyways, Reverend Shaga, yeah, so revival broke out in New Bedford. I remember the Catholic churches had spirit-filled priests and all the people were lined up the streets all the way down. Miracles were happening in the Catholic church at that time. I tell you, New Bedford was turned upside down. Everywhere you went, people were evangelizing, preaching the gospel, that, that's my memory. I tell you, I've been in so many revivals, it's incredible. So anyways, Reverend Shady, so I gave my life to, to Christ at the Nazarene Christian Church. So what ended up happening was I was hungry, no one was discipling me. I was reading the Bible, but I didn't know what I was doing, I was just hungry. So what ended up happening was I used to see people still smoking, still this, still that, and I'm like, why, why are they still, you know, as a young girl, I couldn't understand it. But anyways, I still had the hunger, and during those times, um, I had terrible fear in uh, public school, grammar school. I couldn't deal with conflict. I would pass out. It was terrible stuff I was going through. Uh, my friends would, if they would come around me and make fun of me, whatever, I'd fake passing out. They would call the ambulance. I'm just trying to, to expose the devil, the spirit of fear. If you yield to that, you will be locked up inside. Don't yield to the spirit of fear. He's real. He's real, and he, he plays on little children. I've learned that over the years. So anyways, that was my uh, growing up experience with fear. So anyways, what ended up happening was I left the Nazarene church, and then I ended up going to the Baptist church as I get a little older. Uh, so I ended up there. I was 16 years old. I got my first job working at a daycare. So that's how I became a teacher. I got certified, etc. And I, love, I didn't know I had a love for children until I entered into that world, and I'm still in it to this day. But anyways, what ended up happening was um, I did one year of that, and I decided I'm going to go into the military because my oldest brother was going to. The military was a big, a big deal back in the day. They had more respect back in the day than they do today, unfortunately. But anyways, uh, so that's what ended up happening. I ended up at the age of... 17, my dad had a sign for me to go into the military. He begged me not to go, and I wish I would have listened to him, because boy, oh boy, that was a different world. But I kept with me a pocket Bible, a pocket Bible, and I would read that in the dark, you know, like at three in the morning when we were getting up, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, so I did, I was in the Army National Guard, my other family was Air Force, etc. Army. I did Army National Guard just to try it out. So anyways, the Lord was with, with me because I went through a lot of stuff in the military. I don't even want to talk about it. It's too, it's too crazy, too crazy. But the enemy tried to destroy me through that, but it didn't work. So anyways, I get out of the military. You know, as an Army National Guard, you do the drills once a month. and. I was getting a ride with these two guys that were fired up in the morning, and I said, I can't do this. I can't do this. The enemy is trying to wipe me out here, so I stopped doing the drills after close to a couple of years, and that was that. <clears throat> I ended up getting an honorable discharge. But anyways, uh, put that aside, I went back to the same daycare. You know, I must have went back five times to the same daycare <laughs> after I left and went back. But anyways, um, that's what happened with me. So I was still battling fear, etc. I went back to the same daycare. I heard this woman, oh, let me get back to the Baptist church. So I was hungry for the Lord. I was following a woman that I thought was very spiritual. You know, she would sing spiritual and all that. And then one day I went to her house and she was chopping up some fruit in the pantry. And I'm sitting there, she's talking to me. I'm sitting in her uh, living room and I hear out loud, she's a phony. I'm looking around like, what, what? God was protecting me. She's a phony. And I'm looking around like, what's going on? What's going on? And she's still talking to me. I don't know what she said. And I heard it again. She's a phony. And I said, God, is that you? And I said, I didn't get out of here. See, the Lord was, because she was a phony. It ended up being she was a phony. But see, I was so hungry for God, nobody was helping me. So I ended up leaving. And she's like, where are you going? Where are you going? And I said, I gotta get out of here. I'm going home. And I never went back. To this day, the truth came out about her. God spared me. He spared me from nonsense. But anyways, that's what happened there. So that was the Baptist church. And I also saw a lot of supernatural things that nobody told me was supernatural. I, when I was at the Baptist church, um, we had Bible studies. So I went one night to the Bible study, and there was this alcoholic, 
a man that was really drunk. He came and staggered and staggered and sat in the chair, and the pastor preached the word to him. He came right to him, just like that. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw a lot of supernatural stuff that nobody told me was in the Bible or supernatural. So anyways, aside from that, I went back to the daycare. I'm working there. I was hanging around with sinners because I was struggling with sin and loving Jesus. Nobody told me I had to be filled with the Holy Ghost. But one day I went to the daycare to work and I saw this woman preaching to my friends that I hang out with. And she's telling them the word of God. And I knew the word because I was a good reader of it. So I'm walking towards that direction and there was Nancy preaching to my friends, and I said, what she's saying is true. And all my friends are like, yeah, right, yeah. I said, no, what she's saying is from the Bible, it's true. So what ended up happening was, God sent Nancy to mentor me, I had no idea. So I left the, the Baptist church, and then I went to Nancy's church, and I didn't know what her church was about. So I, the first time I went there, there was a Bible, uh, a prayer meeting, and I'm sitting in a chair watching. I probably was at least, 18, 19 years old, I was young at the time. So they're all holding hands in a circle, praying in tongues, praying in the Holy Ghost. And I'm like, ooh, what is that? So anyways, um, the pastor looks over to me and another person, he says, do you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost? I said, whatever that is, I need it. So I got up and I got, I got the Holy Ghost just like that, just like that. I was so hungry, so thirsty. Anyways, that was the end of that. But after that happened to me, the, the devil tormented me, said, you don't have, you don't have the Holy Ghost. You got this. You blaspheme the Holy Spirit. He, I mean, he beat me big time in my head. So I had to learn to wield this sword. Do you understand the only way you're going to conquer fear, conquer panic attacks, conquer the devil? He's already been conquered. But it's with the sword of God. It's not with your emotions. It's not what people tell you. You've got to pick up this Bible and wield the sword and chop his head off when he's lying to you. So every day I had to say, no, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. The word says this, Acts 2 on the day. I had to learn, not just to keep the Bible in my brain but in my heart and wield the sword. So eventually, that was it. I never again had panic attacks. I never had a bout with fear. I, had, I never had any of that to this day. Because you get revelation. When you learn how to wield the sword, the devil backs up and he knows you mean business. And he can't take that ground anymore. So that was that for me. I was overcome with, I, I pulled down the stronghold of fear with the word of God. And that was the end of that. He never came back to bother me. So my eyes were open to truth. You know, my eyes began to open spiritually. So anyways, yeah, Berean Fellowship was the name of the church that I was a part of, spirit-filled. And in that church, I got involved with everything. Clown ministry, serving, singing in the choir, uh, ushering. I didn't care what it was. I was just in the middle of it as a young girl, 19, probably close to 20. And... Uh, I was just doing everything, and I didn't, you know, I was just serving. That's all I knew. But uh, what ended up happening was, uh, after a year or two, they, they, the church was supporting missionaries in Haiti, and they said, Linda, we want you to go to, as a missionary to Haiti. And I'm like, no, where's Haiti? I don't even know where Haiti is. So anyways, what ended up happening was I went with a group, a missionary group from the church to Haiti. They paid my way, I went. Ooh, it was it hot there? Was it hot there? I must tell you. And I, I wasn't happy. I was miserable because they stunk so bad and the mosquitoes were chewing on me and all this stuff. So I only stood seven days, came back home, and I said, God, I don't ever want to go back to that place. I don't ever want. And that was my attitude. Well, like a year later, the church says, we want you to go to Haiti again. I'm like, oh, my word. So I went to say, well, another thing I had to do was fill out a form that said, what are your gifts? And I had no idea. I was just involved with so many things. I said, God, forgive me for lying. And I put prophecy, I put healing, and I said, <laughs> and when I went the second time to Haiti, God used me in all those gifts. Yeah. All of them, all of them. I, knew it. I was like, okay, I didn't lie after all. So anyways, what ended up happening in Haiti was uh, this man, this God-fearing man, his name was Francis, 
And he would give us tours, you know, the Christians tours of different parts of Haiti. Haiti was beautiful, aside from all the terrible poverty. So anyways, um, Francis would, and I met a woman named Marion. She came from Connecticut, she was a black woman. And she introduced me to Francis, he would take us everywhere. So what ended up happening was, uh, war broke out in Haiti, in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, uh, between the government and the people. It was it was a rough time, but we were 20 miles away. So what ended up happening was uh, we all were going to have dinner at the compound where all the missionaries gather. And the lead missionary said, did you hear the bad news? And we're all sitting there getting ready to eat. We said, what bad news? And the pastor, uh, George Tetelis was his name. He's passed on. And he said, Francis got shot five times, and they don't think he's going to make it. That was the, the tour guide. I tell you, the Holy Ghost just dropped on my spirit, and I went to war. I don't know about anybody else. I went in my room, and I, by the grace of God, by the word of God, I, I knew the word, so I could say, no, you're not, devil. You are not taking this man, and he was a good soul, a good man. So I don't know how long I prayed. It might have been two hours, three hours. All I knew was when I got up, I had victory because the peace of God. And then I never saw him again, whatever. My friend Marion that introduced me to him went back to the States and malaria started to break out. So the missionaries were getting malaria. You don't know what malaria is. Your palms will itch, your feet will itch, the sun is too bright. They were freaking out, the missionaries. And I thought, okay, I was helping one of the head nurses there on the compound, you know, with all the emergency stuff, which was interesting. God gave me grace for that. But anyways, uh, what ended up happening was, after a while, a month or two, I felt like it was time to go home. Now, I never wrote my family and said, I'm coming home. I just showed up. <laughs> so anyways, the devil tried to put malaria on me. I started itching, and I said, no, you're not. The word says this, the word says that. I fought it and fought it and fought it. I said, you're not doing it to me. On the day that I'm leaving, I don't think so, and I was fighting it. All of a sudden, you know, when I finally got to the airport, got in the airplane, I felt the healing power of God flow right through me, and I knew that I knew that I was healed. Nobody could tell me. The symptoms went away, whatever. I'm telling you, this word works if you work it, if you have faith in the word. So anyways, when I finally got home, my mom said, what are you doing here? I said, I just felt like it was time to come home and malaria was breaking out and the devil tried to put it on me. She says, what do you mean? You need to go to the doctor. I said, I don't need to go to no doctor. I'm all, I've already been healed. The Lord healed me on the plane. She begged me to go to the doctor. I said, all right, I'll go. So when I went, there was nothing. There was nothing there. So I tell you, when you work this word, You'll never be the same. So anyways, that was that. I never went back to Haiti after that, but back to daycare I went. They kept hiring me back and They must have loved my skills or something at that time. So anyways, back to the daycare, and then all of a sudden, at the same church, the Spirit-filled church, Berean Fellowship, they said, Linda, we want to pay your way to go to Bible college. And I said, Bible college? Well, okay. See, I just, I did everything, I didn't care. So they paid my way. I went to a Bible college in Barrington, uh, Rhode Island, which is near Massachusetts, and it was called Zion Bible Institute. Now they changed the name, it's called Grace Point, something like that. So I had the, the pleasure and the honor to go to what, I just went one year. That word of God, revival was breaking out in the schools, we hardly had classes. The Holy Ghost would take over, miracles, healings, People would get delivered. I mean, not every teen that goes to uh, a Bible college or a Christian school is, is saved. You found that out. I found that out. But anyways, yeah, revival broke out, and oh, man, my life was turned upside down with one year of the Word of God. I went crazy. I just went everywhere, talking whoever, wherever. Uh, one day I went to the store for my mom. And this guy ran out of the store. I'm like, what's his problem? He had a devil in him or demons, and he was afraid of me. <laughs> it dawned on me later on. I said, okay, he's afraid of me. So I never had that experience in my life. He went running out of shawls. I'll never forget it. And one day we had this uh, football player. He was a professional football player. Boy, was he good looking. But anyways, that's, this is a long time ago. I was single then. I wasn't doing anything wrong. So anyways, he came. And revival broke out of the schools. We were meeting out on the field. It was incredible. You guys, 
whew, I've been in a lot of revivals. And this guy was just, he was radical. A former football player, he was an evangelist. He was calling people out. He was doing, I mean, God was using him. And I was so excited. I was just fall. I was like this, he was like the Pied Piper. I was just following him around. I, I was so excited for people getting all this word and stuff. And all of a sudden, he turns around and he points at me. And I'm like, me? And he says, you have a heart after God. You have a heart like David. And I'm like, I didn't know what that meant. But, I mean, he just turned around. And I, was, I was following him around. I was just excited. I didn't know. And the next day, everybody said, she has a heart like David. He called her. I, I, I had no clue. I was just in it because it was exciting. And I loved the Lord and what he was doing in my life. So I did one year of Bible college. Oh, my. So... I, I tell you, you got to go to Bible college. It's incredible. The first year, they'll never be the same. So anyways, the Lord began using me. I began mentoring people. I began coaching people that were struggling in the house of God. See, I learned how to wield the sword of God, how to win in prayer. I was learning all the secrets, all the keys of faith, like our sister talked about. Faith is one thing, but faith in the word is another thing. It's who you have faith in. So anyways, what ended up happening was... I was back at the daycare after the one year of college, went back to the same place, and I started mentoring people, and there was a woman named Lisa, and I felt like God said, work with her, so I did. And, you know, she'd come to church, and she had two sons, and I would go by her house. I knew her situation with her husband, you know, because he, he was a drinker, unfortunately. So one day I was driving home, and the Holy Ghost said, go see Lisa. Because I was going to pass her house. And I said, oh, I'm just tired. I don't feel it. Go see Lisa. And I'm like, oh, man. All right. So I back up the car. I go into uh, where she lived. She lived in the projects. Ring the buzzer. And I'm like, she's not home. Ring it again. And I'm like, I did it Ring it again. See, I'm listening to the voice of the Holy Ghost. And I said, okay. And she said, who is it? And I said, it's Linda. She goes, okay. And she let me in, because you have to go by the buzzer. Her husband comes flying out. I'm like, what's going on? So I went all the way upstairs. He was choking her. He was trying to kill her. So if I didn't listen to the Holy Ghost, she could have been dead. Mm -hmm. I was exhausted that day. Working with kids, I don't wear you up. But I'm so glad I went to the house, because he came flying out. And I walked in, to, he's trying to kill me, he's trying, and her sons are right there, you know. So we have to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost when he tells you. Many times he'll yell out loud, you, you'll hear the audible voice. Now, God doesn't always work that way. You gotta be, he's trying to get your attention if you're not listening. So anyways, another woman I started mentoring, she fell through her floor. I don't know how that happened, but she fell right through the second floor, down. And I was mentoring her, so I figured I'm going to go visit her. I went to see her. She had a cast all the way up to her thigh. And I said, what happened? She said, I fell through the floor. I said, oh, let me pray for you. So I was radical. I just do anything. I didn't care. She got instantly healed. I said, stand up. And she started banging. Oh, it doesn't even hurt. Oh, my God, there's a miracle, a miracle. So she got, I'm just saying, God can use anybody. You don't need a title. You don't need a podium. All you need is faith in what he says. She got instantly healed. Yeah. She got instantly healed. Not that I needed it. I, I was just available. I was a radical. That's the way you gotta be in these last days. So anyways, I had too many supernatural signs and wonders happening for anybody to tell me God ain't real or he doesn't care for you or care for this person. He's real and he's very present. He's right. very present. So anyways, that was a story with that. Uh, so what ended up happening was um, I ended up getting married. I met another man, and he was a man of God. So I ended up getting married. Um, my first pregnancy, I ended up having twins, and I didn't believe the doctor at all because I was 95 pounds. He said, you're having twins. I thought I had the flu because I was growing up, growing up, growing up. And I said, twins, what are you talking about? He says, you're having twins. He told the nurse, turn on the machine. So I turned, he, she turned it on, and I saw two little heartbeats. I said, he ain't lying. I'm having twins. I couldn't believe it. First time having a baby. But anyways, I went home, tried to tell my husband. He didn't believe me. 
And he said, you're not lying. I said, I'm not lying. We're having twins. So anyways, my stepdaughter, he had a daughter, and she was so excited. She always wanted a brother or a sister. And so she started, and I was believing, they told me I was going to have two girls, and I said, no, I'm going to do a Hannah prayer. Father, if you give me a son, I'm going to give him right back to you. And my stepdaughter started hanging up a pink paper and a blue paper, so we were just believing. That's all we knew. Anyway, so after... I, they were hugging each other throughout the whole pregnancy. So I had to carry them for like 39 weeks. They kept saying, wait another week, wait a, I mean, I had to gain 50 pounds. I was 95 pounds, so I had to consume all this food. My, I couldn't fit behind the steering wheel. I had to have my friend bring me places. Oh my God, that, that was quite an experience. So anyways, when they pulled out the first one, they said, it's a girl. The second one, it's a boy. God. So I was excited, and they, I tell you, I never had an issue with my children. They always kept each other uh, company. Uh, my son always made my daughter laugh, and they, it was like a comedy show in the bedroom. He's in his crib, she's in her, ah! and all he hears is this commotion. They're having such a good time. One day I take them to the Friendlies, and they were about four years old, and so uh, the waitress says, um, what are you going to have? And, and Oh, what are their names? And my daughter goes, my name is Joy. My son said, my name is Matthew, and I'm born again. And she went, born again? So he was evangelizing at a young age. So uh, right now they're in the military, and they're still being used of the Lord, so I'm grateful for that. My marriage lasted 21 years, and that was it, because whew, it was too much for me. I mean, I'm going to get into all the details. But anyways, that's how I ended up here. My daughter was on the military base. Uh, I, I, quit, I was fighting for my house, but when I went back home and put the key in, all the fight left me. God said, no, that's it. So I ended up here, because I couldn't afford to live in the home. home. I, my daughter was on the base here for about eight years, nine years, so I lived with my daughter until she left. And now she's in Maryland. My son was in Germany for a while, now he's in Wyoming. So we're going on 12 years in the Air Force, and I, and I thank them for their service and for their commitment. So anyways, yeah, after having twins, that was it. I didn't have any more children. I wanted seven, but my husband only wanted one. But God blessed me double, and that was one of my very first prophetic words. The woman said, God's going to give you double for all the mess you've been through. Uh, at that time, am I taking too long? I don't, which time was A18? Is that the correct one? Okay. So anyways, what ended up happening was I got a prophetic word that I would get double because I suffered a lot. Even as a, a, a Christian growing up, learning to wield the sword, because of fear and inferiority, I still was battling certain areas in me. At that time, Bill Hammond came around, him and the prophets. So I didn't know what my calling was. Nobody called it out or whatever. I thought I was a pastor, teacher, brother. I didn't know what I was. So anyways, Bill Hammond's people came around, and one woman nailed me good at a woman's ministry, meaning she targeted everything I was going through. She called me out in front of all these women, and I'm like, oh boy. So anyway, she said to me, uh, God is going to take those areas where they're difficult areas where you're trying to be and trying to pull yourself up and trying to uh, stand your ground. See, this is what I was going through, trying to in my own. Deep within me, I was, I was suffering. It, it was a suffering I was going through. I don't know if it came through my mother's bloodline, my father's bloodline, if it was witchcraft, but whatever it was, it was, it was doing a job on me. So she called me out and she said, all that you're going through, God is going to reverse it. You're going to become tough. You're going to become vocal. You're going to become this. You're going to become that. So uh, it's happening in my life today. People think I'm such a bold, whatever. I never was this way. I never was. I was always a scary cat. So if you see me coming at you with the word of the Lord, this is the new me. This is the new. And I am not to hurt nobody. I love everybody. And I told this guy yesterday at Circle K, he was gassing up, blasting some filthy music, which I didn't appreciate. And I said to him, so you got to be bold today. I said, I said, you. I said, Jesus loves you. I said, he can turn your life around. And he said to me, oh, I know, I have Jesus in my heart. I said, well, you need to play some music that Jesus loves. And he just, see, Holy Ghost will move if you open your mouth. Open your mouth. Tucson needs us. I said, Tucson needs us. Not to be hiding behind a closet or, 
Come on, I'm here to fight. We're here to take over, church. Do you understand that? Do you understand we're on assignment? I never thought I'd be here in Arizona. I didn't think I'd be worthy to be here. I didn't think I was, uh, God was uh, going to promote me or do anything for me because of what I went through in my divorce as well. The shame I battled, crying every night. But look at me now. Come on. What the devil meant for evil, God is turning it around for my good and my children's good. So anyways, that's what ended up happening. Mentoring, pregnancy. And I'm going to tell you right now, church, it's not time to think small anymore. We are going to see the bigness of God. It doesn't matter what it is because we're living in the last days and Jesus is coming back. And guess what? We can allow him to come back quicker if we do our part. If you open your mouth, God says, I will fill it. Not with foolishness. He'll fill it with the word of the Lord. He'll fill it with life. He'll fill it to give someone else. I saw, I'll tell you, Circle K is going to hang out. I heard these two people, and they were young, talking about, I was drinking all this liquor, and this one was drinking all this liquor, and I'm thinking, I didn't get in the middle of this. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm a sniper for Jesus. <laughs> oh, you don't know what I do in homes here, but anyways. So anyways, I heard them conversing, conversing, and I'm like, Holy Spirit, tell me. And I'm just waiting, waiting, and all of a sudden I heard the girl say, because it was a guy and a girl talking about how much they were drinking. The girl said, why do we drink so much? Why are we drinking this way? And that's when I came out. I said, why are you drinking this way? And I began to preach the word of the Lord to them. Conviction came on the guy so much, conviction. The girl's like, see, I could have kept my mouth shut and could care less, but Jesus loves the multitudes. He loves the black, the white, the brown, whoever you are, the blue eye, the African, the native. He don't, come on church. It's time to get bold for Jesus. They are dying out there. Tomorrow's not promised for them. Many are trying to contemplate suicide at the moment. Who's going to go and tell them? Who's going to go and tell them? Why not you? Why not you? Come on. We are the church. We are the army of the Lord. And Jesus already did it all. He conquered the devil. He conquered sin and death. Not only for the world, but for us. He, sa he saved the best wine for last. Do you want it? Do you want the wine of the Holy Ghost? Because it's being poured out. The Holy Ghost is a person. He's not a thing. Right. He's not a religion. Right. He's with us now. Jesus has ascended into heaven. He's praying. Hebrews 7.25, he ever liveth to make intercession for the saints. That's what Jesus is doing. So guess what? He's counting on us to flow with the Holy Ghost to get the word out and to lay hands on the sick. Oh, man, yesterday this girl in the circle came. I wanted to lay my hands on it. I didn't have, it just bugged me. I didn't have time. I, didn't, I was so mad. But she was telling me about her throat. And I had to be at a place like in two minutes. And she was over the counter. I was ready to lay hands. I didn't have time. That bugs me. Prostitute walking down the street. And I said, I'm going over there. Come on, we got to do the work of the, of the evangelist. I go up to her. I said, what are you doing with your life? And she begins to pour out and pour out. They took away my children. <laughs> Her heartache, her heartache, I didn't have time for that one. But I do pray, I do pray for them. But we gotta make ourselves available, church. God's pouring out the best wine for now. Holy Ghost and fire. Not lukewarmness, not religion, not pew sitters, not anymore, not anymore. I'm heading somewhere, I'm heading to heaven. But I wanna take people with me because Jesus died for that reason. It can't just be your family. It just can't be your family. The whole world Jesus died for. Amen. Whether it be at the gas station, whether it be at the hairdresser, don't keep silent because they're hurting. They're hurting. Whoo, glory. Anyway, so I started that with Isaiah 46. And you know what Jeremiah 29 says. For I know, and that's verse 11, the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, right. not to harm you. Look at me, I'm all the better. I'm all the better, I'm all the bolder. He made me, he healed me, he set me free. Right. 
No alcohol could do it for me. I tried that. Not even men. I tried that. My mother and father couldn't do it for me. Right. And I have to tell you, how did I come to Christ? My mother was a big drinker, and I didn't know why she drank so much. When I used to come home from school, my mom would be passed out on the chair. I didn't understand what was going on. One, my mom didn't have her license. She never drove. We had to bring her places. One day she got dressed up. I said, and I didn't like my mother because she was in that condition. I said, where do you think you're going? She says, I'm going out. I said, wait, you go out? You don't even go anywhere unless we bring you. Where are you going? I'm going to church. I said, you go to church? My mother didn't go anywhere by herself. I said, you go to church for what? And she said, I believe God's going to deliver me from drinking. I said, the day God, I said, the day you get delivered is the day I know there is a God. She came home and never drank again. And she went to the Nazarene church. It wasn't even a spirit-filled church. I watched my mother. People, I mean, Latinos, we drink a lot. And I'm not saying everybody, but Puerto Ricans, we, that's how we did our, uh, family stuff, you know, pull out the Bacardi, pull out the beers. I'm not saying everybody does it, but I was in that environment. And I watched my mother very closely. She never drank again. So God reeled me in even more when my mother stopped drinking. So I had a lot of miracles. I've been a part of a lot of revivals. I went to Toronto when they poured out the wine and the oil there. Whoo, that was powerful, powerful. But we have yet to touch what the Lord is going to pour out. I mean, we're going to have so much Holy Ghost wine and oil because of the times we're living in. We're living in dark times. These are the end times. They said they began in the book of Joel, the end times. So what do you think we're in now? When I stand before my king, I want to give an account and say, sir, I did everything you told me to do. I open my mouth, and I want to hear him say, well done, Linda. Amen. Well done. You've been faithful over a few things. Now I'll make you a ruler over. But I want souls, church. Come on. I want to go out and evangelize. I need some help. I mean, I do it by myself, but it's only one-to-one. -one. So I'd like to start this Saturday. I know I didn't talk to you, Veronica, about evangelizing. I know that's something I spoke about in the past. But I really would like to start going out this Saturday. So we'll talk later. But I'm, I'm here. I'm going to give out a few prophetic words because I feel the Holy Spirit leading me in that direction. If I have that liberty, Veronica. Uh, I believe in protocol. I believe in submitting to leadership. I believe in honoring leadership and I'm just grateful for this opportunity. Rebecca, I must tell you. Rebecca, you have your recorder on. I'm going to give you the word of the Lord. Rebecca, Rebecca, in the back, sister. You have your recorder on? <laughs> you ain't ready. Okay, I'll skip you. Teresa, you got your recorder on. I got the word of the Lord for you. <laughs> oh, Shaya. Forgive me. Oh, glory. Oh, Shaya. Thank you. Shaya, Mahaya. It's just the Holy Spirit Church. It's just the Holy Spirit. Teresa, God says today he wants to use you. From this point on, be available. And he says, don't look at yourself in the mirror and think you're a failure. The God in you is bigger, and he's going to make you bigger. I see you, I get the word classified. If anybody can tell me that, uh, what it means, classified. Okay, the word is classified. You'll have to look that up. I know in the newspaper there's a classified section, but you'll have to look up that word classified. But anyways, Teresa, I see you heading into your promised land. We're out of exile, church. We're out of exile. We're not in the wilderness anymore. So, Teresa, I see you heading into your promised land. I see you with your husband. I see you with your children. I see you running. I see you facing giants, and they're coming down. They're terrified of you, Teresa. Keep moving forward. Don't let friends, what friends tell you, what fam, whoever, don't agree with the enemy. Because God's destiny is today, it's not tomorrow. So when you suit up in the morning, Lord, I'm available to be used. But your word is classified. Check that word out for me, if you don't mind. Uh, Rebecca. Mm. Oh, shit. The 
Rebecca, I see you moving out of your hair thing. I see you moving out of that, sister. Whoa, whoa. Great hush. I see you in other nations, Rebecca. I see you evangelizing because you have a prophetic edge and you know how to be bold for Jesus. But the enemy is trying to stomp you down, saying, no, you can't, you can't say that. I don't want you to go there. No, I don't want you to speak to that one. You're going to get out of that hair stuff, Rebecca. It's time to advance in God's kingdom. And I see you, Rebecca, married as well. God has a special mate for you. Stop dis discounting yourself. Don't do that. You are highly favored of God. You are royalty. Jesus shed his blood for you to walk in wholeness in your mind, in your body, and in your soul. Amen. You're going forth, Rebecca. Amen. The nations, you're rising to the nations. You're an intercessor, and I hear the nations crying out for you, Rebecca. Amen. You have a message to bring. Go forth, sister. I see the key. You, you're going to go forth. Amen. Oh, glory. Oh, glory. I don't know. Shia. Veronica, I tell you, you got quite a future, Veronica. You know, when uh, Prophet John was here last time, I don't know if it was last Thursday. Oh, I saw you with Prophet John with city council. I saw city officials. God is opening doors. I did Isaiah 22, 22, the key of David to the city. You. Prophet John, of course your husband, uh, Prophet Smeliani, you're going to walk through some, some doors for the city of Tucson. You, I don't know how long you've been here, sister. It don't matter with God. He's going to use you, key of David. Favor, favor with the leaders, council of this city. Prayer, prayer, prayer. We are going to break forth into 24-hour prayer. Tucson is going to turn upside down. There was only 11 disciples that turned the city upside down. Oh my God, church, come on, come on. Get in the ranks. Let the Lord use you. Amen. I'm glad you're ready. Amen. <laughs> Amy, you have entered in to what God calls the fullness of time. You have a lot inside. In fact, you're carrying something right now, and you're going to give birth. And I'm speaking spiritually, Amy. I see you with children. I don't know if you love children. I have no idea. But I see you in the middle with children, Amy. I see that. Almost like a person that's doing nursery rhymes, you know, I'm a nanny, I do it all the time, I know it in my heart. So you're able to feed, and I'm talking about the Word of God, I'm not talking about nursery rhymes, taking a little bit of the Word of God, and just the children are like little birds, eating it up, eating them, eating it up, and they're all, they're, their eyes are so wide. I see it, Amy. You are going to birth something that's going to be, I, do you have a business as well? I, I see success, success, Amy. I'm you're going to walk into this thing. Believe God for it. Believe this is your time. We're out of exile. Get going, Amy. God's got so much for you and your husband. Luke, are you a believer, sir? You love Jesus. Uh-huh. Do you love the nations, Luke? Do you have a heart for any city? You're going to be a nation taker, the both of you together. You're going to take nations. You're going to go forth. The new wine, the new oil is going to take you beyond your own self, beyond your own comprehension, beyond your own ability. I see you two running like champions, feeding the homeless, the orphans. I see that. Nations. God is calling many to nations. It's not just Tucson. Is that your son? Yes. What's his name? John. John. Do you love Jesus, John? Just answer the question. Yes, sir. 
Do you love Jesus? Is he asking me a question? He's not Christian. He's not a Christian. Would you like to give your life to Christ? He has a purpose for you, John. It'll blow your mind what Jesus can do with one person. Look what he did with me. It don't matter your age. You don't have to be intelligent. You don't have to be, have a college education. He will qualify you, sir. You gotta be willing, John, to give your life to him. He gave his life for you. Did you know that? He shed so much blood. He had you on his mind. It's time. Tomorrow's not promised you, John. And don't listen to the enemy. He's out to kill, to steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that you may have life. Do you want life? Choose life and not death. Choose blessing and not cursing, John. God is for you. He's for you. My sister Angela, missionary, do you like, do you love the nations? I see you as a missionary as well. Big, big heart you have. Loving, loving, kind heart you have, Angela. One that Jesus would never overlook. He'll never all overlook your prayers for John. I pray for him a lot. Yeah, and he's going to answer your prayer, Angela. No matter what the devil tries to tell you otherwise. Because he's a miracle worker. We sang it tonight. But you have a missionary heart, Angela. You're going to see some nations as well. Don't try to figure it out. Just walk. Keep walking by faith as you were exhorted. My brother, at the end, what's his name? Um, Jimmy. Jimmy. Do you know Jesus, Jimmy? You have him in your heart. Are you filled with the Holy Ghost, Jimmy? Yes, I do. You speak in other tongues, Jimmy, for Jesus. It's in the Bible. It's in the Word of God. Acts chapter 2. Job 2. Job 2, 28. Well, you just told me you gave your life to Christ. Well, let's do it. You can give your life to Christ. Repeat after me. Father, forgive me. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. Please forgive me. Jesus, come into my heart. Take control of my life. Give me a destiny. Show me your love and show me your path. In your mighty name, amen. And there's no condemnation, Jimmy. I bind it now in Jesus' name. You have the mind of Christ. God's going to give you clarity. Do you have a Bible, Jimmy? Get in the Bible. The Gospel of John is where you need to go. In the beginning, bless you, sir. It's an honor to meet you. I bless you. Whoosh, I am. And here, my sister Alicia. I hear the Lord saying, well done. Well done, Alicia. You know, you're enlisted in God's army, Alicia, where you work at. No matter what the devil tries to tell you, you're an honorable soldier. You have honorable, I see, honorable medals on you, Alicia. God is saying, well done. The best is yet to come for you, Alicia. You are not going to be the same, no matter what people say or how your family feels. It's all besides that. When you begin to rise and fly like an eagle, Alicia, that is your destiny. You're not going to be tied down anymore. Do you understand? Tied down to a job. No. God says prosperity for you, Alicia, because he says, well done. You're one that gives your very best. You're one that pours it out, Alicia. He's going to reward you. I see prosperity. I see a new home for you, Alicia. I see a new future. We're out of exile. We're out of there. We're now heading to our promised land. And we got to be fearless because the enemy will try to contend. He'll try to stop you. But guess what? He's a defeated foe. He's been already overcome. Betty? God says he still has need of you, Betty. Your prayers, your faith. God says he still has need of you. You have a servant's heart. I see you serving, almost like a nurse, just bandaging wounds, healing broken hearts, Betty. 
Young girls, they need your assistance as well. They need your prayers, Betty. And the Lord says, I have need of you. It's not time for you to leave. It's not time. I know. As you get older, you feel like this world's crazy. Get me out of here. But guess what? We're here for souls. We're here to do the work of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Your husband, believing for a miracle, guess what? You're going to walk right into it, sir. You're going to walk right into your miracle because we serve a miracle-working God. You know, when the children of Israel left the, uh, the wilderness, not a one of them were sick. Not a one of them had whips, whips because they, they were slaves. They didn't have wounds, nothing. The Lord healed every one of them, even if they were blind, if they had sight. This is the God we serve. Come on, church. you got to rise up. you got to... Your expectation has to go higher now. Emily. Oh, Emily. Emily, Emily. If you only knew the future. If you only knew Emily. God wants you to be rich. Emily. You're going to be one that's going to fund the kingdom of God. Emily. you got to rise up, sister. I know your world is your children. I get it. I get it. When my kids were little. But guess what? God says, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about you, Emily? You're going to be a multi-millionaire. And you're so gracious and kind. And your daughter's incredible. Um, Veronica, every time I'm around her, I'm like, oh my God, she's, she's beautiful. You're just beautiful, Emily. You're going to be one of the multi-millionaire. For the kingdom... Because you're faithful, you're a good steward. The Lord says you're an excellent, not just a good steward. You're an excellent steward, Emily, and he can trust you. I'm telling you, money's coming your way. You think real estate? Real estate's just a piece of it. You're going to own a lot of land, a lot of property. Please, Emily, you've got to rise up. Don't stay in the same same old, same old. The Lord says, come on, I want to bring you higher. You're going to be so blessed. I'm telling your daughter, Veronica and Rob, you just, it's incredible what I see for Emily. Vanessa. Oh, excuse me, Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa, Emily is over there. Forgive me, I'm just drunk. I'm just drunk. But Emily, now that we got you, I'm going to be closing. Emily. The Lord says he's going to vamp up. You know, if you hear Emily pray, it's incredible. Emily prays the heart of the Father all the time. When I hear her, I'm like, yeah, she nailed it there. She nailed it there. Oh, that was awesome, Emily. You're going to be an intercessor that's going to be one that the enemy is going to be so terrified. Emily, don't back up for nothing. Get the sword. Get in this book. Get the promises, if you have a promise, book, whatever. Speak the promises with the problem, for the problem. That's how it works, until the lights turn on. You know, Ephesians 1.17, the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. You need revelation, you need to see. This is not a religious book, it's a lie. So Emily, a lot of hurts, my dear, that has to go. Jesus says he's your healer. You're going to trust him, Emily. I know it's been hard for you. I know it's been hard for you. The Lord says he's praying for you. He's going to interrupt your situation and circumstance. He's going to step right in the middle of it, Emily, for you. Because he's a God that makes impossible situations possible. He's going to heal your heart, sister. And guess what? That wonderful, sweet heart you have. You're going to pour it out on young girls. And I say sex trafficking girls as well. Emily, they're waiting. God's going to step in and take care of business for you. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord. Yes. I guess I better get Nimsy because she's the last one. Oh, Nimsy. The sky is the limit for you. I know you're carrying again. Another precious, precious champion for Jesus. 
I won't tell you what it is. I can tell what it is. Nimsy. Do you play instruments, Nimsy? God wants you to play an instrument, honey. You got a good voice. It's anointed. But you got to play an instrument for Jesus. Can't you start with a guitar? Something simple. Yeah. Piano. You got to get on it, sister, because that'll only amplify the anointing on your life. It'll only amplify. I know you're busy with your children. God will make a way for you, Nancy. I see you with a group. I see you singing with a group, Nimsy. I see you making your own albums. Nimsy on you. Incredible. Incredible destiny. God's going to heal, heal the situation at home, Nimsy. The Lord says, be of good courage, because you're faithful. God's going to heal some stuff there. All right, dear? They'll take care of your children. Don't worry about your children. He's got them. Father, we're grateful for this time of prayer, this time of preaching, prophesying, uh, Holy Spirit. We love you. We worship you. We're so grateful for this. I'm grateful for this opportunity. I'm grateful for this church. I'm grateful for Tucson, Arizona. I'm grateful you brought me here, Father. I ask your blessing on each one. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would lead them and guide them into all truth. May they never be the same because they're out of exile. We love you. We worship you. We honor you tonight. And we thank you for traveling mercies. Thank you for the angels with us, Father. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.